Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is William Barnett. Bill is the Oswald Distinguished Professor of Macroeconomics at the University of Kansas and is director for the Center for Financial Stability. He's also the editor of the journal Macroeconomic Dynamics. Bill joins us today to talk about his work on better measurement in macroeconomics, specifically as it applies to monetary policy and the measurement of money. His work in this area is nicely summarized in his 2012 book titled Getting It Wrong, How Faulty Monetary Statistics Undermine the Fed, the Financial System, and the Economy. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a real treat to have you on. I read your book. I really enjoyed it. And I encourage our listeners to go get a copy themselves. It really is insightful. Um, you, you learn a lot about money and the measurement of it and how important it is. And we'll get into all that later. But before we do, I want to ask you, as I do most of my guests, how did you get into macroeconomics? And you're a very special uh, story because you actually were a rocket scientist. I don't think we've had any rocket scientists on the show before, but you were an MIT rocket scientist and somehow you found your way into macro. So tell us how you did that. Well, it's a complicated story. It was an unusual time in American history. It was believed that the United States was in a race with the Russians to get people to the moon. In retrospect, we know that was not even true. The Russians had concluded it wasn't worth the cost, and they were not even trying to do that. But we thought they were. As a result, the federal government was pouring enormous amounts of money into the space program, and a lot of people wanted to get into engineering at that time, and in particular to work under NASA contracts on the space program. I was hired when I finished my my engineering studies at MIT by Rocketdyne, a division of North American Aviation. Rocketdyne made the rocket engines for Apollo, for the, for the Saturn vehicle, all of them. The booster engine was the F-1, which was the one that got it off the ground. It was the most powerful rocket engine in fact, even to the present day, it is still the most powerful rocket engine ever produced by anyone. It produced one and a half million pounds of thrust. It was quite fascinating to be working on that rocket engine. At the time, because the country thought it was in this race with the Russians, the NASA contracts were extraordinarily generous. Initially, they were set up as what was called cost plus fixed fee contracts. Did not produce very good incentives. Hmm. The way that worked is that the, the, the corporations working on this for NASA could spend as much as they want, and it, it did not affect the fee. So they got the same fee no matter how much they spent. So they were quite generous to their engineers. One of the things they did is they offered educational leaves for every year that you were employed working for Rocketdyne, you earned a one-year educational leave. And I took all of those benefits. I spent a year at Berkeley getting a master's degree basically in finance and continued eventually getting uh, PhD studies at the University of Chicago and Carnegie Mellon. I had already become interested in economics going back to MIT, although I was an engineering student in my senior year. I was permitted to take a graduate course from Franco Modigliani, which I found to be just extraordinarily fascinating. I I never forgot that course. And at Berkeley, on one of my leaves, in in finance, I took a course from David Laidler in economics, and again, this further inter- increased my interest in economics. 
But from the standpoint of Rocketdyne, what they really wanted me to study was statistics. The reason was, in the days when they were just flush with cash, they were planning to open a new division of the of the corporation, and it was to be a pure research division. The intent was to be doing research on potential future space programs that did not yet even exist. The intent was to employ only PhD scientists, and they needed statisticians. So they they did want me to emphasize statistics in my graduate studies, which I did do. In fact, my PhD ultimately was in statistics. But while I was pursuing my graduate study, the Vietnam War grew. As the Vietnam War grew, funds to NASA declined and funds to the Department of Defense increased. So what happened was eventually funds for that new division were withdrawn. So there was not going to be a pure research division of Rocketdyne when I finished my PhD and presumably returned. But the intent was for me to return to that division, which wasn't even going to exist anymore. In addition, by the time I had my PhD, Apollo had already gotten to the moon. So interesting research and development on the space program was in a rapid decline. Engineers working in that industry were either moving to production engineering, which did not interest me, or transferring to other divisions of the corporation that made fighter planes and things for the Department of Defense, which also didn't particularly interest me. So when I got my PhD, I resigned from Rocketdyne. I I explained that that the vision that I was supposed to return to didn't even exist anymore. They understood, they didn't seem to mind the fact that that I, I was not going to do what they thought I was going to do because it was ultimately impossible. In addition, One of the reasons I did that was because while I was working on my dissertation at Carnegie Mellon, I received a rather remarkable offer from the special studies section at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C., which at that time was an elite research section. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, but it it was a great place to work. The deal was that If I came there, and this was as a full-time, this was not any kind of temporary thing. This was a full-time offer as an economist, a full-time economist job in special studies. But the arrangement was that for my first year, I could work full-time on my dissertation. Well, that sounded great. So I finished my Carnegie Mellon dissertation research while being paid full-time in Washington, D.C., At the end of the year, I simply returned to defend my dissertation and then went back to the Federal Reserve. I had this great deal there, and that's basically the story. (laughs) Well, that's a great story. So you had the intellectual curiosity, but we can thank uh, the generosity of NASA, at least early on, for pushing you along this path, and then the Vietnam War for changing funding priorities. And all those kind of interesting facts come together, and here you are, a macroeconomist working at the Board of Governors. And I know we'll get into the the, the nitty gritty later, but when did you first stumble upon this issue of properly measuring money and and the, the index and aggregation theory issues? Well, my dissertation research largely dealt with modeling and estimating consumer demand functions and Mm -hmm. systems of demand, consumer demand functions and production modeling of factor demand systems and output supply systems, that literature had become very advanced. In fact, it looked very good from the standpoint of the statistics department at Carnegie Mellon because it involved estimating nonlinear systems of equations, and it gave me the ability to produce some work in statistical theory on how to do the asymptotics 
mm-hmm. with estimation of nonlinear systems of equations, that literature also had very close ties with aggregation and index number theory. This this was well known to people working in this field. It was integrated into that literature. So I had a great deal of knowledge of aggregation okay. index number theory, as well as modeling consumer demand functions, et cetera. In, in contrast, what macroeconomists were doing with my demand at that time was basically the Goldfeld equation, which was just a, a single linear equation. It wasn't integrable, could not be derived from microeconomic theory. To somebody who had been working in the literature on consumer demand modeling, the Goldfeld equation seemed very primitive to me, but I wasn't using it. That's not what I was working on. Then what happened is there was something called the Bach Commission at Stanford. Leland Bach at Stanford created a commission called the Bach Commission. It was taken very seriously by the Federal Reserve Board. What the Bach Commission did was to conclude that the Federal Reserve's monetary aggregates were too narrow. They should include accounts at other institution types, such as savings and loans, mutual savings banks, et cetera, which at that time were providing savings accounts and were beginning to even provide checking accounts. But the Federal Reserve at that time was using only data from commercial banks. The Federal Reserve decided they should look into this. This looked pretty credible to them. And I was then approached to do some work on this. Uh, It was known, of course, in the special studies section that I had this kind of expertise. So I I was asked to look into the Bach Commission proposals, which I was happy to do because I could see a way to use my own areas of expertise. Uh Uh-huh. And that's what I did. It was basically Steve Axelrod, who was the staff director of monetary policy, who asked me to do this. And it was a great opportunity for me because I was able to do some very fascinating research using areas of expertise that I already had in an area where that kind of expertise seemed to be in very short supply. Yeah, well, that's interesting. You know, as you read your book, and we'll talk about this more later, but you know, the Fed walked away from the divisia measures of, of monetary aggregates. And it's interesting to hear you say they really were the ones who maybe first started you in that direction, given your, your background and the desire to look at broader aggregates. Before we get into that, though, I want to just maybe go through um, monetary aggregates for those listeners who don't know what they are. So I'm going to mention some names to you. And these at this level, we'll be talking about simple sum measures, and then we'll jump into divisia forms of them. But just so our listeners are clear, I want to run through the list of, of broad money measures or money ag- monetary aggregates that the Federal Reserve has at some point in the past or currently is um, keeping track of. So let's start with M1. What is M1? Well, it's the narrowest aggregate. It's intended to include strictly legal means of payment, transactions, balances, but but I, I would like to throw in something sure. immediately regarding this subject. I mentioned that Steve Axelrod was the person who asked me to do this. When he did that in a private conversation, he imposed a constraint on me. He knew that I wanted to propose using reputable index number and aggregation theory, not simple sum aggregation. But also, that literature also has a criterion for clustering components. It's the test of what's called blockwise weak separability. The the data, the aggregate has to track a function that exists that has to be factorable out of the structure of the economy. So to people working in consumer demand, before they would decide how to aggregate over components, 
they would decide how to choose the components, and the criterion was to run tests of blockwise weak separability. What Steve Axelrod said to me was that if I wanted the Federal Reserve to consider changing the method of aggregation over components, I should not simultaneously challenge their clustering of components. So I was told, in effect, that they would not listen to me hmm. about methods of aggregation over components if I simultaneously disputed the clusterings. So in my work, I never tested for weak separability of the components of M1, M2, okay. M3, or L. I had basically been told not to do it. However, this did provide an opportunity to many academic economists who were not at the Federal Reserve at the time. They understood this need, and many other people started running those tests, but I was not permitted to do it. Okay, so you you just had to work with the aggregates they had given you. Um, and, and, the, and you mentioned M1 already. Um, there's also M2... M3 and L. So what, what, what's an M2 measure? What's an M3 measure? And what was the L measure? M2, what's significant? I'd like to point out what's yeah. a little bit awkward about it. What, what M2 is supposed to do is, is to bring in mostly time deposits. But there are a couple of components in M2 that create a certain amount of paradox. One is... M2 includes non-negotiable certificates of deposit, which are highly illiquid. There are big penalties for cashing them in before maturity. But M2 does not include negotiable CDs, which are very highly liquid. So that's kind of odd that they, they decided to put into M2 something that's extremely illiquid while excluding the really illiquid stuff that see, they, they did this having to do with the denominations. The, the negotiable ones are large CDs, the non-negotiable ones are small CDs, but there is a huge difference in liquidity. So this is sort of odd. I, I doubt that this would pass a blockwise weak separability test. Another thing that's in M2 that, that's, I'm not going to dispute it, but it's a little bit paradoxical. It includes money market mutual funds. Money market mutual funds are what are now considered shadow banking. At that time, very few people were even talking about shadow banking, and certainly the Bach Commission was not suggesting that shadow banking start being brought into monetary aggregates, but M2 contains some shadow banking, which again is a little bit puzzling. Now, M3 and L are actually quite fascinating. What they include primarily is the money market. So if, if you're in a finance department and they're teaching you corporate finance, when they talk about money, they're talking about the money market. Mm -hmm. That's what big corporations consider their primary source of liquidity. They have a controller, they have a, experts in finance who manage large port, portfolios of highly liquid money market securities, such as negotiable CDs, commercial paper, treasury bills, things like that. That's what is primarily brought into M3 and M4. M4 even brings in treasury bills, which are federal. It's a different kind of thing, but it's part of the negotiable men money now, market. M4 is like L, right? You're using th those interchangeably. Yeah. Oh, similar? yeah. Right. Yeah. We we call it M4 now, but it okay. was called L. It's You're called correct. L it was called L. Okay. So so that's that's basically it, and by not using M3 and L at, at the present time. People who don't use M3 and, and L are basically not using what large corporations consider to be money. <laughs> that's the puzzling thing. That, and I think that's one of the lessons from this crisis, at least for me and I think for a number of other people, 
um, it, it made it made it more aware that the crisis that it was important to be looking at a broader <laughs> measure of money. Um, that the, the run on the banking system was a run on the shadow banking system, the wholesale banking system, not retail. And that, but there was no measure of money readily available for that. So let me ask this question then: If, if you're doing monetary policy analysis, or if you're advising some of your grad students, and they come to you and say, "Hey, we want to, you know, look at the effect of a monetary policy shock on the economy," first off, you tell them to use Divisio, which we'll get to in a minute. But after that, would you tell them to use like a, the M4 measure? I mean. Which measure, if you're doing monetary policy analysis, should one use, an M4 or something smaller? Well, the word uh, monetary policy analysis creates problems for me. I, okay. I, I, I want people to recognize that, that competent measurement is competent measurement no matter how policy is conducted. If you look at, say, the Bureau of Labor Statistics – or the Commerce Department, or even the Agriculture Department, they employ experts in index number and aggregation theory to produce competent aggregates consistent with a relevant microeconomic theory, unbiased by what particular policies are being contemplated by the Congress or the White House or the or the central bank. From this standpoint, again, any component clustering that is blockwise weak separ- weakly separable is fair game. It measures something that exists. The, the problem with a narrow aggregates, as is well known to people who work with consumer demand systems, is the, the, the more narrow the aggregate, the more substitutes and complements there are outside that aggregate. That means the demand function for that aggregate aggregate has a lot of prices in it of substitutes and complements. So, for example, M1, to do a good job of modeling the demand for M1, you've got to have a lot of explanatory variables in that demand function to account for the fact that there are lots of sources of liquidity that are not in M1, and their user cost prices are relevant to the to the demand for M1. There are substitutes and complements. When you go to broader aggregates, you've internalized more of that. So there are fewer remaining explanatory variables that you have to worry about. With the broadest aggregates like M3 or what the Center for Financial Stability now calls M4, those are quite broad and they do weight everything in a competent way. So they include the relevant transaction services of the components in all of these assets. They don't impute a weight of zero to some substitutes. So it's easier to deal with the broader aggregates. Their demand functions are particularly stable and they don't just throw out relevant sources of liquidity. So in in most empirical applications that I've worked on, the broader divisia aggregates for most purposes work best. Okay. I did do a study in a for a paper that I presented at the American Enterprise Institute on this. It was subsequently published in the JMCB in which I ran all of the tests that the Federal Reserve Board staff runs itself to choose aggregates. And I classified all of the possible aggregates in terms of which ones did best. In the vast majority of cases, Divisia M3 or Divisia L worked best. There were a few criteria in which an M2 aggregate worked particularly well. As I recall, I think there might have even been one or two cases in which simple sum M2 worked well. But the overwhelming majority of these tests concluded the broadest divisia aggregates for those particular cases work best. But I would never say that any weakly separable uh, component clustering is inadmissible. There could be ways in which it could be useful. 
All right. Let's let's move on and let's talk about uh, the division. You kind of alluded to some of these issues in your pat and your comments you just shared with us. Uh, but but tell us what in general terms, what a divisio measure does that a simple sum measure doesn't do, and, and, and really, what's the critique of a simple sum measure? There's a very fundamental difference. The divisio index is directly derived from aggregation theory and index number theory. Relative to that literature, it's competent. Similarly, a Fisher ideal index that would use user cost prices would be viewed as competent. A Lesper or a Posh index number using user cost prices would be considered competent. The simple sum aggregates are very simply incompetent. Hmm. Ever since, since Fisher's book, Irving Fisher's book in 1922, the making of index numbers appeared, it concluded that the simple sum and arithmetic averages were the two worst aggregates he could even find. And following that book, no other government agencies use that anymore. Commerce Department does in agriculture, only unfortunately, Central banks are still using simple sum aggregation, but it is just plain incompetent. Now, you, the reason it's incompetent, if I understand correctly, is when you add together, for example, an M2, all these different assets, everything from a savings account down to currency, you're assuming they're perfect substitutes when, in fact, they're not. Is that the big critique? Yes. Reputable... Index numbers such as Fisher Ideal, Aspera Posh, Divisia would reduce to the simple sum as a very extreme special case. Mm-hmm. That the special case is that the components are perfect substitutes in identical ratios. So it means that each component is a one to one perfect substitute for every other component, not two for one. So you can have perfect substitutes that are perfect substitutes two for one. That would be linear. Mm -hmm. Simple sum is a special Mm -hmm. case of linear in which the coefficients of the linear function are all equal to each other. For that to happen in free markets, the component prices must always be equal to each other. With monetary assets, the user cost prices depend upon the component interest rates. The component interest rate of currency is zero. For the user cost price of the other components, say an M2, to be the same as the user cost price of currency, the interest rate has to be zero. But that's not the case. That that ended a very long time ago. A very long time ago, money was currency plus demand deposits yielding no interest. Yep. Then the Vizia, Posh, Lesper, Fisher ideal did reduce the simple sum. But now that there are so many assets considered monetary assets yielding interest, that special case is simply not relevant. Yeah, you gave a good example in your book of how this is important. I mean, you gave several examples, but one that really struck out to me was this L measure, or what you now call M4. M4 has treasury bills in it. So you can imagine a simple sum M4 measure where a scenario occurs where the government begins to monetize the debt. So it, you know, maybe the Federal Reserve starts buying up in order to support the government, starts buying up debt. It's increasing the monetary base, increasing some currency, but it's taking debt out. Well, M4 or the L measure would, would be stable. You, you'd just be substituting one asset for the other, and you wouldn't see any change. Any, there'd be no signal that maybe inflation will be headed up, where the Divisia M4 accounts for the fact that these aren't perfect substitutes, and you would see an increase in M4. Because currency is so much more liquid than, than the treasury bills, the way it's, it's calculated, M4 would actually go up 
um, it wouldn't be just uh, stable as it would be with a, a simple sum M4. That's one of my favorite questions on exams. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, I like to bring that up on exam questions. Oh, that's but a yes, great I one. completely agree with that. Yeah, that's it's, it's fantastic. And you know, what's interesting, if you looked at standard simple sum measures, you know, going into the crisis and even after the crisis, you really don't see any action there. I mean, and that's what's fascinating. A lot of people will say, well, M2 didn't change, M1 didn't change. But if you look at your Divisia M3, your Divisia M4, which is publicly available, you do see this sharp contraction in these money assets during the crisis. Uh, so it's, I think it's a very interesting and fascinating um, part of the literature, something that you've been very um, important in, in furthering. So tell us about this idea called the Barnett Critique. So you have a critique named after your name. What is the Barnett Critique? That term was coined by Crystal and MacDonald, British economists, very good British economists, in a paper that they presented at a conference at the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. It's an interesting insight. What they were referring to is the appearance of instability of the demand for money function. For the demand for money function to be stable, the method of producing the aggregates used within that function must be based upon theory that's consistent with the theory that produced the demand for money function. It all has to be nested. The, ag the aggregation, again, it's really about aggregator functions that are factored out of functions. So it all has to be nested. If the aggregator function is produced in a way which is inconsistent with the theory that produced the demand for money function, then the resulting demand for money function can appear to be unstable when in fact it isn't. The, the appearance of instability was produced by an internal contradiction between the aggregation theory and the demand system. Again, this is a problem that would never occur in the consumer demand literature. Everybody understands this in the consumer demand literature, but in the literature on the demand for money function, this source of internal inconsistency was being overlooked. It is somewhat analogous to the Lucas critique. The Lucas critique similarly argues that the structure of macroeconometric models could appear to be unstable when the deep parameters of the private sector are confounded with the parameters of the Federal Reserve's policy rules. Again, it's a similar concept of an internal contradiction within the econometric approach. Um, so I, I like what Crystal and McDonald said. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, now, the practical application of this, if I understand correctly, is making sense of some of the money confusion in the 1970s, right? So there was a period where people looking at simple sums, you know, predicted a certain relationship, but it didn't appear. They said, oh, money, there's money, there's missing money. Um, and in fact, one of the critiques you'd hear today, probably the most common, even I might call it the standard critique of looking at monetary aggregates. In fact, I'm sure many listeners of this show are skeptical about looking at money aggregates. They would say, well, there's an unstable money demand relationship, right? So the relationship between nominal income and money just isn't there and it needs to be there if we're actually going to meaningfully use money. But what you show in your research and you have some great graphs um, in the book as well is that money demand actually was stable during that period. It just, it was mismeasured and, and had, had the Fed embraced this idea of divisia measures sooner, there wouldn't have been as much confusion. Sure. In fact, my view is the exact opposite of the, the, the point of view you described. Uh, my view is that relative to the usual procedures for estimating and modeling consumer demand systems, the demand for money function is 
surprisingly stable. To me, that's the real paradox. It, when I or other people use the kind of approaches used in the consumer demand literature to, to model demand for money function, it's no problem at all. But oddly, even when they do things like estimating the Goldfeld equation with the Divisia index on the left-hand side, where the Goldfeld equation would never be taken seriously by somebody who works in the consumer demand literature, the Goldfeld equation nevertheless becomes stable. So to my way of thinking, the puzzle is, why is it the demand for money function seems to be easier to model stably than the demand for durable, semi-durable services, anything else that professionals in the consumer demand literature struggle to have their model by semi-non-parametric procedures and infinite dimensional parameter space. It's an enormously sophisticated literature. Demand for money function, you don't even have to be that fancy as long as you measure it right. Yeah, and, and I think this is real, again, practical implications. So you mentioned in your book, one of the key jobs of the central bank, the Federal Reserve, is to provide liquidity services. In order to do that properly, it needs to measure and know what's happening to broad liquidity, which the measure like L or M4 provides. And the Fed effectively quit keeping track of that. And, and even when it was keeping track of it, it did it poorly. And I think you know one of the key observations that that macroeconomists and others have made coming out of the crisis is that we need to wrestle more with financial institutions, the financial market, the financial system, because a big shock there can cause problems. And I think one of the points you make in this book is starting in the '60s up to the present. One of the, the key issues is the Federal Reserve was doing a bad job keeping up with financial innovation because the way they measured money. And again, it's not saying that money has to be the sole objective of monetary policy, but as an additional indicator of what's happening to liquidity in the financial system, it would have been very useful going into the crisis. In fact, you talk about the great moderation quite a bit. And one of the interesting insights I hadn't thought about that you bring out in the book is that it wasn't just you know Fed officials who may have been confused by looking at, at bad measures of money, but the public... Financial markets, they all were misled by a false sense of uh, security, of stability that would have been more carefully understood had they looked at these division measures. So could speak to that a little bit. The great moderation um, produced a, an exaggerated degree of confidence in the capabilities of the world's central banks. Even Lucas wrote a paper saying that the central banks had gotten so good at monetary policy that the economics profession should stop doing research in counter-cyclical policy and should only concentrate on long-term growth. Greenspan was a fantastic salesman. I wasn't on the staff of the Federal Reserve Board when he was chairman, but he was a consultant. Every six months, there's a panel of economic advisors that they bring in, and Greenspan was one of them among some very famous economists. There were people there like Tobin and Modigliani and all kind of Meltzer, and there was Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan tended to dominate the discussions. He is an extraordinarily charismatic, friendly, interesting person. Everybody liked listening to him. He would say things that other people wouldn't be so comfortable saying. He would claim he could do things that the academic economist would not claim they could do. But of course, he had been a consultant. And in the consulting business, you want to tell corporations that you can do everything and you're really good at it. Right. Well, he was a fantastic, and he is a fantastic salesman. And what he did is he sold everybody. He sold the whole world on the idea that, that he had the, Wall Street, for example, talked about the Greenspan put. The Wall Street story was that they could trust Greenspan 
to have their back. He would prevent an asset decline. He would go in there and stop it. So there was this very exceptional degree of confidence in the in the central bank during that period for reasons that really had very little to do with the central banks. It had more, frankly, to do with China. But, but in any case, it did produce excessive confidence and it affected Wall Street in a very adverse way. Wall Street firms became convinced that they could take risks exceeding any risks they had ever before taken in their history. Some firms that had survived the Great Depression of the 30s failed during the Great Recession because they were taking even greater risk. And it was because they had acquired excessive confidence in the central banks. Alan Meltzer also had that view. It was a very widespread point of view, and it was unfortunately not justified. And if we had had these divisive measures, you argue that it would have been more clear that the Fed actually hadn't been um, hadn't tamed the business cycle. There were these bouts of excessive easing and tightening. Um, and, and you mentioned in the book, it starts in the 60s. Starting in the 60s, there's kind of this growing ignorance surrounding what's really happening to liquidity conditions. Um, let, let me go back to the Volcker period, because that's also another fascinating time. You mentioned in there when, when Volcker engineered the, the double dip recession in the early 80s, he turned to uh, targeting um, bank reserves. And at the time, the Fed was also, I believe, looking at the broad money aggregates. And one of the interesting exchanges you had with him, or at least an observation you made, and later later he said he was allergic to you because of this, was that you showed that if you had used the divisia measures of money during this period, you would have seen that Volcker excessively tightened policy. They were looking at the broad simple sum measures, which didn't show as much tightening. But had they seen the divisia measures, they would have realized that the Fed would have realized that it had overdone it in terms of tightening. Yes, but I, I wish to emphasize he did not say he was allergic to me. He said oh, okay. he was allergic to the Vizia monetary. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, what, what happened? What, what happened was, I, I was in fact in a board meeting with Volcker and the rest of the board, in which I showed that the rate of growth of the divisia aggregates was about half that of the rate of growth of the simple sum aggregates. And uh, in fact, three of the other governors asked me to send a memoranda about this. Uh, I should add, I had great respect for Volcker. What he did was very admirable after what William Miller did, which was not so good. Volcker was a very decisive person. Something had to be done in a decisive way. He said he was targeting money growth. That's true. He, he was telling the truth. M many people are defensive about that because it created a recession. Many people want to say, well, he was really not telling the truth. He was doing something else. It was not caused by targeting the money supply, but he was telling the truth. In fact, I published an interview in Macroeconomic Dynamics in which, in which he explained this, that he, he, he couldn't find any other relevant criterion to deal with the inflation at the time. I, I did publish a paper on this in the American Statistician, which is published by the American Statistical Association. It was a rather amusing experience. In that paper, I provide the plots of what happened during the so-called monitor, monetarist experiment. What was going on was that the simple sum aggregates were growing at precisely the rate that the Federal Reserve wanted. The idea was they didn't want to crunch down too fast. There had been a study at the American Enterprise Institute saying that if the money supply were, if its growth rate were dropped to the intended long run target rapidly, 
under the assumption that rational expectations would just get the economy to adjust really fast to that shock, it would be okay. But the American Enterprise Institute said there are too many labor, long-term labor contracts, and it would, it would create a recession. So the intent was to bring the double-digit rate of growth of the money supply down to about 10% or so. And that is exactly what the Federal Reserve did in terms of its simple sum aggregates. But if you look at that paper, you, you'll find that what I found for the corresponding divisi aggregates were growth rates about half that. So that they were at what, what was the intended long-term growth rate that the AEI study had already said would cause a recession. It was rather amusing when I submitted that paper to that journal. The editor sent it out to an an incredible number of referees. I don't know how many it was, but it was much more than normal. All of the referees really liked the paper. Of course, it was for a statistics journal. So some of the comments were, well, gee, this is going to show people how useful statistics can be in policy. Anyway, the referees loved the paper. But the editor called me and said he was very nervous. He said, the American statistician has a letters to the editor section. And he was afraid that since this would look so controversial, he would be overwhelmed with negative letters to the editor, and he didn't want to have to cope with that. So my reply to him was, well, I, I am sure there are a lot of people who won't like this paper, but none of them read your journal, so don't worry about it. He published <laughs> it, and he did not get any negative letters to the editor. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. Uh, and again, it, it underscores the importance of getting measurements right. Um, going back to the Great Moderation Period, again, you stressed a good part of your book, you know, this this misperception of superior monetary policy, you know, kind of induced risk taking and a better measure would have made that clear. And, and you, you show that very clearly in your book. So this leads kind of to the next question. Why hasn't the Fed embraced this more readily. Why, why not use it? Well, there are a lot of central banks that do use it. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily admit it. The Bank of England officially provides a divisia monetary aggregate. The ECB does have divisia monetary aggregates. In fact, they hired me as a consultant to set up the database, and they provide their the Vizia aggregates to their governing council whenever it meets, but they do not provide it to the public. The Bank of Japan has the Bank of Poland, Bank of Israel. The IMF advocates them. So that many central banks have them, don't necessarily want to talk too publicly about it. The interesting question is why is it that these, these different central banks, including the Federal Reserve, have different ways of dealing with it. Some of them, such as the Bank of England, are completely open about it. Some of them have it only for internal use. Some maybe don't use it at all. This gets into a subject that is way outside my area of expertise. It is mechanism design. This is associated with the work of Leo Hurwitz, who won a Nobel Prize in this area. Mechanism design is a deep area of economic theory dealing with incentive compatibility and how to design institutions to be incentive compatible. Designing, optimally designing a central bank so that it would be incentive compatible to do what is ultimately in the public interest is an enormously difficult mechanism design problem. That's why different central banks throughout the world have different mechanism designs. If we were talking about a corporation, it'd be easier. I mentioned Rocketdyne before. There was a mechanism design problem. They had cost plus fixed fee contracts. NASA figured it out. They changed it to cost plus incentive fee contracts. That fixed everything. Trying to produce an optimal central bank that's on its own, going to always do what is in the best interest of the public is an area of research that is way outside my area 
of expertise. It, it's the basic reason that so many economists want to talk about rules. It's because we all, in some way or other, understand that producing an optimal mechanism design is enormously difficult. We probably don't know how to do it. And if we did do it, we probably couldn't get it done. So then there is the idea, maybe they should be constrained in some way. But the root cause is mechanism design problem, which is an enormously difficult problem. You mentioned that the Fed quit tracking M3 in 2006. It quit tracking L before that. But that was unfortunate because you know M3 has some of that shadow um, banking money in it. It would have been very informative to see what was happening. Could have been another signal to the Fed, you know, tell them what's going on. Um, now, you mentioned some other banks are tracking this information. You're tracking it as well. So tell us about your work to kind of fill in this gap for the U.S. at least. Uh, what are you doing at the Center for Financial Stability that kind of fills this void? When the Federal Reserve discontinued M3 and L, which we now call M4, I had mixed feelings about that. Um, certainly, in my opinion, simple sum M3 and simple sum L were just terrible. The Fed was correct in discontinuing publication of them because okay. they put much too much weight on the distant substitutes for money. So they're terrible. They were terrible aggregates. They recognized this. They did research showing that they were terrible aggregates, so they discontinued it. Unfortunately, when they did that, they also discontinued providing the components. This was very unfortunate because those components are not easy to acquire. They had been doing it in a very sophisticated way. When the Center for Financial Stability decided to start doing this using index number and aggregation theory, they also had to acquire those data. This was a project that took over a year with various assistants trying to track down the relevant components, but we eventually did. And then, of course, they stopped providing data on sweeps. This is very unfortunate. It grossly biases M1. So, so we have to model sweeps with an econometric model. We have no choice. The, the, the problem is that the Federal Reserve isn't providing a lot of the component data that we would really need. In fact, in, in my book, you probably noticed I, I reached only one policy conclusion, and it was a mechanism design suggestion. I didn't advocate any particular rule or policy like that. What I advocated was the creation of a data agency such as the uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the the, the BEA mm -hmm. in in Commerce Department. These are bureaus that employ uh, that have autonomy, employ experts in aggregation and index number theory, and their job is to provide good data. The Federal Reserve doesn't have such a bureau. In my opinion, it would be very advantageous if they were simply to create that kind of bureau, the same kind that the Labor Department and the Commerce Department have. The fact they don't have it raises an even deeper problem of mechanism design that I, I don't know how to solve. This is outside my area of expertise. But my suggestion is they should do that. They should create such a bureau within the Federal Reserve System. Yeah, and just to repeat the point you made, these other agencies, the BEA, Bureau of Labor Statistics, they're doing cutting edge you know, measure, measurement theory, so aggregation theory, index theory. And the Federal Reserve is not. They're using outdated approaches for money. What I, I found really fascinating in your book is that you mentioned the one place where the Fed does use cutting edge measurement theory is in its construction of the industrial production index. There it is very careful, but it doesn't seem very careful on the one thing that really, you know, it, it should be careful about, and that is some measure of monetary conditions. 
And what's it's striking to me too, that, you know, it's not like the Fed has a, a small budget and it's worried about, you know, making ends meet. It has a very, lately, a very large budget and it could definitely afford that. Uh, you Interestingly, you also mentioned placing this Bureau of Financial Statistics, the name you gave it, maybe inside the Office of Financial Research, which is autonomous from, tre- it's in Treasury, but autonomous from Treasury. Let me move to another question, and this is more generally towards the economics profession. And again, I think part of the challenge, maybe even for the Fed, getting it to do what you've suggested is simply getting more economists on board, more macro economists, because the, the micro folks are in their own areas, but the more macro economists on board with this idea of divisia measures of monetary aggregates. What is your sense of where the profession is? Is it, are, are more and more folks getting on board and, and, make, and agreeing with the point that you've made? Uh, throughout the world, there, there are people working in this all the time. There's an enormous amount of research in it. Um, the, the, the problem is the policy relevance. Uh-huh. It, in, in consumer demand modeling or, or production modeling, things like that, people with that kind of expertise can do their work without any kind of issues about implications for policy. Monetary aggregation potentially has implications for policy, and that kind of messes with it in an okay. unfortunate way. Because of my background, I am basically a scientist, and I stay out of that kind of policy stuff. I did that even when I was at the Federal Reserve Board in the Special Studies section. I didn't get involved in that sort of thing. Uh, the, the people who are experts in aggregation, index number theory, of course, they're completely on board. The first time I even presented this was at University of Chicago in Zellner's econometrics series. I think this was back in around 1980, 1981. I went through all of the research and everything. And at the end, Zellner said to me, gee, Bill, if you had just told me you want to produce the VISI indexes with user cost prices, I would have agreed right away. <laughs> well, yeah, people with that kind of expertise, they just instantly see it. Mm-hmm. But but people who have vested interests in various approaches to policy, which is very complicated, I'm not a political scientist, that kind of muddies up the whole situation, unfortunately. Yeah, and I, I guess when I look out and I see other commentators Fed watchers, other macroeconomists, there's this kind of knee-jerk response, this thinking, oh, we, we've learned that money can't be used reliably. We learned from the 70s and the 80s there's missing money. We learned that there's you know, unstable money demand. And, and that's kind of a, you know, if I, you know I, I can't say certainty what the percent of people who hold that view, but it seems like most of the folks that I see who make these comments draw that conclusion. And it, so it seems to me, and none of it is true, right? And and that's and that to me, that's that's the the audience that needs to hear this message. Those are the folks that need to be reading your work and then the related literature on this. Um, and I, I think it's important. I I, you know, I would love to see the Fed, even if everyone's not on board, at least provide this information um, and hopefully you know open up some minds to its usefulness. Yeah. But, but I, I tend to think they're doing me a personal favor. If, if they were to do everything right, my book, Getting It Wrong, wouldn't sell. <laughs> and if I had had to write a book, Getting It Right, it wouldn't have sold. Very true. So I, I cheer them on. I'll just keep <laughs> doing it wrong. It's good for me. My uh, book will sell a lot of copies. I love that perspective. And on that great note, we have run out of time. Our guest today has been Bill Barnett. Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.